Amateur Traveler, episode 874. Today, the Amateur Traveler talks about red rocks and camel tours, gorges and green palm trees, skippies and royal flying doctors, as we go to Uluru and Central Australia. This is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler. Let's talk about Central Australia. I'd like to welcome to the show Chris Fry from TheAquariusTraveler.com, traveler spelled with two L's, who's come to talk to us about Central Australia. Chris, welcome to the show. Hi, Chris. Thanks so much for having me. I want to ask people first, could you put it on a map? I think we've already done that. Look at Australia. We're talking about the middle. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. If you talk about Central Australia, you put it on a map, it is basically the dot. And this is where Uluru is and that whole Central Australia region. Excellent. And what's your connection with Central Australia? People might have guessed by have... now that you're from Australia. <laughs> <laughs> yes, if you can't tell from the accent. Yes, I am Australian. I was actually born in Western Australia originally. I've spent most of my life growing up in Queensland, Bundaberg, and I'm currently living in Brisbane, which is the capital of Queensland. And I have travelled probably to Central Australia and the Uluru region about four times in my entire life. My first time was probably about three years old and then another three times after that both to do a road trip around and get different experiences and stuff and every couple of years they seem to bring out new things and I'm like oh I've got to go see that so yes so I've always done that and so I've been to the area a few times done my road trips and everything and this is the way that I love to travel because I love to do things in my own time schedule. Excellent and why should someone go to Central Australia? So I like visiting Uluru for the Aboriginal culture, the art, the history, learning about the dream time. I think it's where I first started learning about the Aboriginal history and our First Nations peoples. And it's one of the best places to actually learn about it there, I think. Some of the tour guides are actually Aboriginal, so they will actually tell you their history, how they grew up and, and everything like that. So yes, I think it's it's great for Australians, it's great for tourists to actually learn about that firsthand from the people who have been living here for 65 million years. Excellent. And what kind of itinerary are you going to recommend for us? I've got a 12-day itinerary here for us today, and we're actually starting from Alice Springs, because as a whole, you'd probably spend only a few days in Uluru, and a lot of people mm -hmm. might not know that Alice Springs is about five or six hours driving distance away, but there's so many things to see along the way, which includes in and out of Alice Springs, doing some four-wheel driving areas, which I would never actually recommend a, a four-wheel drive or driving a four-wheel drive for someone that doesn't know Central Australia. So most of it is actually sealed roads. So you can get away with that. But yeah, maybe just one day doing a tour into an area. But yes, 12 days would take us from Alice Springs. The good thing about Alice Springs is it's easy to get into as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah, a lot easier than Ayers Rock. So there's more flights coming in and out of the region. So especially from places like Sydney. Other capital cities do. I know here from Brisbane, certain days they won't have direct flights. You do have to connect through Sydney or Adelaide to actually get direct in there. So that's why I like. And sometimes the prices are actually cheaper too. <laughs> and you've just mentioned the elephant in the room here, Uluru, and you've also called it Ayers Rock. And it's got two names. Okay. Yes, so Ayers, Ayers, Rock address is, it. <laughs> Ayers Rock is the Australian name, Uluru is the Aboriginal name. Mm -hmm. I believe it's going by both right now. It's not one or the other. So a lot of my blogs and everything, I will always mention Uluru, but I like putting Ayers Rock so people know that it is actually the same place. And, and because that might be what they're searching for on Google, so you need to do exactly. that. Exactly, yes. <laughs> I <laughs> understand. Exactly right. <laughs> Excellent. So you started us in Alice Springs. What are we doing in Alice Springs? You can hire a car from the airport there, and this only needs to be a two-wheel drive vehicle. Okay. Yeah. So day one is basically just flying in. Okay. So day two, we're actually seeing the sites around Alice Springs. So the town itself, it has animal parks. I think there's a desert animal park. There's a kangaroo sanctuary. There is a chance to actually ride camels. I'm not sure whether you're aware, but camels roam free 
in Central Australia and in other areas of the outback. Not um, that they were originally from Australia. You know, I think they were introduced, but they've got so many that now they actually, I think they farm them for meat as well too. So I've actually eaten a camel pie in Birdsville in outback Queensland. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> It was actually quite nice. It was really nice. But Alice Springs as such, they have the Royal Flying Doctors Museum as well. Alice Springs is actually an integral part of the Flying Doctor Service. So it's a national charitable health organisation delivering health care to the remote region. Okay. Well, we're going to slow this down just a little bit. You mentioned an animal park. So that's the Alice Springs Desert Park. And I'm seeing not animals from... Africa or whatever, I'm seeing the local animals. Yeah, so we have the red kangaroos, so dingoes. Mm -hmm. They've also got a nocturnal house with bilbies. Bilbies are something that I've also seen in outback Queensland. They've got a sanctuary there as well. So what a bilby is? (laughs) Bilby is like a, I don't know, a larger rat. (laughs) Okay, okay. It it looks a lot cuter though. (laughs) (laughs) Got it. One of the things that I'm still yet to see in Central Australia, so it might be on my next trip, but they do have thorny devils in these. So they're like little lizards, but they've got little thorns all over them. But when I like to see all my animals, I like to see them in the wild. So here I am trying to find them in the dirt and stuff like that, as opposed to seeing them in the parks. But this option is not always available to everybody. So it's nice to have the parks around when you have limited time and you want to see all the Australian animals. Okay. And then you mentioned the Royal Doctor Service Museum. What would I see in the museum? Is this planes or is it doctors who have been stuffed and, and put in the museum? Or <laughs> No, you'll see a lot of the remnants. You'll see the remnants of the planes and stuff like that that they actually used to fly in. They'll okay. The telephone service or the instruments that they use the radios and everything like that that they use to communicate with the remote staff to actually get the help so to find out that people actually need help yeah and to just to learn about what they do the health supplies and everything like that where they get their donations from and stuff and yeah because like i said it is a charitable organization so they do rely heavily on donations got it okay basically between the Royal Flying Doctors Service, the animal parks. There is a separate kangaroo sanctuary where you can actually go and feed kangaroos. Kangaroo parks, I've been to hundreds of them, obviously, around Australia. Some of them can be a little bit more dicey than others because you might get a kangaroo on the wrong day and (laughs) he sits up strong and looks like he's going to attack you or anything. Like you have heard, obviously, about the boxing kangaroo. They always have the, even the little gloves and everything like that. the cartoons, yes. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, exactly. They can actually box you, but instead of boxing you, they will initially put their tail down and use it for balance and kick you with their feet because they've got such little arms. So, yeah, they'll balance with their tail and then literally kick you with your feet. Now, most of these parks, they're used to having people around, so they're not normally like that, but I have seen them like that. I try to tell people, don't get too close. Make sure that they know that you're not coming in behind them scaring them or anything like that if they don't want to be near you they will walk away but most of the time they're there to be fed good time to actually feed kangaroos is early in the morning sometimes late in the afternoon they're just sleeping yeah they like waking up and seeing it in sunrise and getting food that way you mentioned you might find the wrong mood i remember going to one of the other wild animal parks way up by cans and we were feeding a, I think it was a wallaby, and a park yep. person came over and said, yeah, that's not one of ours. <laughs> it's just, oh. But they jump so high, you can only put up the fences so tall. And so it was actually a wild animal that had come in to get fed that day. So. Oh, okay. Which is interesting because the wallabies are there actually the smaller ones. Kangaroos can right. actually get as tall as you, and they will jump high. But, yeah, the wallabies are the smaller ones. <laughs> Excellent. Where to next? 
Okay, so obviously there's other places in Alice Springs, general things like Aboriginal galleries where you'll see a lot of their dot paintings that they sell. Okay. And the, mm-hmm. obviously the funds go to the communities. You can buy your souvenirs and everything. This is in the Todd Mall. So it's in the centre of town. Nice little shopping di- district where you can find some cafes and everything like that if you want to grab some lunch and stuff like that. So, so yeah, you're just filling up the day. Apart from that, you have Anzac Hill, which isn't that hefty to get up you basically just drive up there and you walk probably about 20 meters and you can see the entire alice springs from the hill there it's a memorial or why is it called anzac hill anzac obviously stands for the australian and new zealand army corps Mm -hmm. but yeah as for the history i'm not quite sure why it's called anzac hill (laughs) (laughs) it was as a memorial was dedicated in 1934 to the anzacs of world war one okay there you go. <laughs> okay, so then we get on to day three where we're road tripping from Alice Springs and probably about 100 kilometres outside of Alice Springs. So this isn't actually going to either Kings Canyon or Uluru yet. We're still staying in Alice Springs, but we're actually just doing a road trip out and coming back into Alice Springs. Now, okay. this is a number of sites and gorges. This is Larapinta Drive, and the Larapinta Mountain Range actually runs all along this. There's, there's a, a hiking trail that goes for, I think, a week. I haven't actually done it, so it's probably a bit hectic for me. But yes, the, uh, the ranges are there, so you've filled with all this red rock and gorges and high cliffs and everything like that and some of the sites there is just absolutely amazing so the first one you get to is simpson gap and the one reason i like simpson gap is because it's full of these white ghost gums and in the right light they're just i don't know they look so magical i think yeah big beautiful trees and they're so old and i know the first time that i actually saw one of these ghost gums and i went there 10 years later and it had hardly changed and it was still just so as big as white beautiful. ghost gum, and I'm I'm trying to parse this. So gum tree, we would say eucalyptus, but this is an yes. ab- a albino eucalyptus, or what it's is a, a white? It's called a it's a ghost gum. Okay. Yes, <laughs> and there's one of them literally <laughs> sitting in the gorge in this one spot, and I I recognise it every time I go there. So, but as opposed to that, there is a small gorge there with these high cliffs at Simpson Gap. And you can go swimming there, but the water is freezing. All year round it'll be freezing. But if it's a really hot day, then you can obviously imagine it'd be nice and refreshing. But because of the towering cliffs, there's not a lot of sun that actually gets on it. And, yeah. And a white it's ghost really- gum tree has a white bark is what you're telling me. It is, yes. It's a white tree. Okay. Got it. All right. I got it now. <laughs> <laughs> I've caught up. <laughs> Okay, so the next one along is what they call Stanley Stan. I called it Stanley Chasm for so long, but it's actually Stanley Chasm. So it's actually three meters wide and eighty meter high gorge. And the best time to actually go in there is in the middle of the day when the sun beams can actually mm-hmm. come through and shine in there so you can obviously go there at any time of day there is a small charge to actually get in there i think it's about 12 dollars australian to actually get in there it's never usually that crowded i do remember photos from when i was three years old of my parents had actually taken photos of it being really crowded but every other time that i've been in there it's never been crowded but it does tend to be a lot more crowded during the middle of the day when the sunbeams are actually coming through it but it's so high that yeah you feel like an ant it's so huge. Got it. So Slot Canyon. Slot Canyon. Yes, a Slot Canyon. But <laughs> not as pretty as Antelope Canyon with its formations and everything mm-hmm. like that. So. The next place along is called Ocker Pit. Now, this is where your Aboriginal history comes into play. And it's all these different colours of orange, yellow, red, and it's all these colours in the rock. And what the Aboriginal people would do is actually scrape off the rock and then mix it with water and actually use it as paint. Oh, okay. Okay. Interesting. And so this ochre pit is only a small area, but the different colours that you can actually see in these rock walls is amazing. Okay. 
I guess this day is probably about swimming and all the gorges and everything like that. The next one is Ormiston Gorge. Now, it is a very popular swimming spot and a small little beach, a sandy beach beside it, but there is another three to four hour. It's called the Pound Walk, and it goes all around the top and the outside, and I've never actually had time to do that, but I have walked around the gorge itself, which was only about half an hour. But okay. you have to get wet for that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then the last one is Glen Helen Gorge, which from the car park only takes 10 minutes to walk down and you can actually see part of the Finky River. And I think it, Finky River is actually popular for a, a motorbike race that they hold there every year. I know my partner talks hmm. about it because he's actually into motorbikes and he's always wanted to do that. But it's a very rocky river and when it's dry, obviously it's not the safest to be driving on, but yes, they have a race there. Okay. Next the question, when you say when it's dry, is there a particular season that you would recommend this trip? Definitely in the winter time. So in winters Australia, so that would be your summer, which so would June, obviously July, be, August. Yeah, it would be an ideal time, but okay. anywhere probably between April and October. Okay. Otherwise, it is too darn hot, yes, especially with okay. all the rock and everything like that, reflecting off and coming onto you, you'd be sitting there drinking two litres of water a day and still sweating. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, yes, definitely a winter, but you will find that the winter time is actually more extreme in the outback as well, which means that you do need your layers. It is warm during the day and it will cool down drastically at night and depending okay. how close to winter it is so taking layers you need long pants you need shorts you need longer shirts you need a light jacket and everything to account for everything i know every morning i used to be wearing a, a light coat but pretty much by nine o'clock everything's off and you're walking around my day four i've got organized for palm valley now this is four wheel drive territory and this is basically a day in and out of alice springs again but doing a four-wheel drive bus tour. I have actually driven in there myself at one point, but I see so many people actually getting stuck. There's lots of holes in the ground and stuff like that, that, yeah, if you're not that fluid in how to drive a, a four-wheel drive, then, yes, it's probably better to actually use one of the four-wheel drive tours. And they'll go in these big, massive buses. They only have about 20 seats, and they're actually quite a nice tour. So, yes, I have driven in there myself uh, on one trip, and I took a four-wheel drive tour on another trip and I must say I enjoyed the four wheel drive tour not only because you don't have to worry about anything else but you get all the local experience as well they'll tell you about everything right. along the way all the history and everything and we even stopped off at Hermansburg I think it was an Aboriginal community on the way for morning tea you get to meet some of the local Aboriginal people as well but Palm Valley is actually the only part of Australia that red cabbage palms and cycads actually survive in the red dirt all of central australia is this bright red dirt and these right. are actually these bright green cabbage palms and cycad trees are actually growing in the red so the contrasting colors especially when it comes in your photos if you are able to be there not in the middle of the day it's quite nice as a photographer myself i actually like the nice contrasting of the green and the red together okay photography. Especially without the having the the harsh light of noonday yes <laughs> the okay. harsh light, yes but yeah they'll take you in there you see all the cabbage palms and stuff and then they'll take you to a lookout point and and everything so i actually really enjoyed that but that's the only four-wheel drive area that you'll need to go to and yeah i think the tours are anything from probably 100 120 dollars for the day okay Okay, so day five, we're actually driving to Kings Canyon. Now, it will take about five hours to drive there. And there are a few things to actually see on the way. Now, in order to get to Kings Canyon, you're actually driving and halfway going to Uluru. And then you're actually going back up again. There is an option when we were talking about all the gorges and everything from Alice Springs on that day, there is a Marini Loop Road that actually goes down to Kings Canyon, which is a shorter distance, but unfortunately it's a four wheel drive road and there's a fee to actually drive on the road, but it'll take you a hell of a lot longer to drive on it. So I will always okay. recommend going. 
the longer way because honestly there's not that much difference in time between it because you have to go so slow on the four wheel drive road but anyway yes we're going halfway to Uluru now like I said before the roads are all sealed the good thing is that they are around 100 kilometers per hour or even 110 some of the areas actually go to which is around 60 miles per hour for you guys Okay. Along the way, you will see things like the Cannonball Run Monument. Now, you would know about your Cannonball Run from, I think mm -hmm. it goes from New York to LA. Back in May 94, they actually held it in Australia and they took it, I think, from Adelaide? No, it took it from Darwin to Alice Springs and return in 1994. And there were a few people that actually died on that. So they built in 2004 to commemorate the people that passed away so there's a monument you stop off for five minutes and get your photos okay and I, <laughs> when i think of cannonball run i'm thinking of a very illegal race was it that way in australia as well where people are racing <laughs> literally as fast as they could i thought that was the point of it yes but when i was reading up on it it was actually uh, going from new york to la i'm presuming when they're going through it it's, they're closing off the roads or something but yes it's going as fast as you possibly can and oh, that's the oh, reason no, it, at least in fast. the movie that most people heard about it from which was a 1981 <laughs> movie it was not closed off uh, and not an official race in the sense no. of approved it was just a, a very fast race across the country that's exactly Very right, illegal. was it? <laughs> Burt Reynolds in it? Yes, exactly. <laughs> okay, now halfway between Alice Springs and Kings Canyon, you have the Old Under Roadhouse. Now, every time you see a roadhouse in Outback Australia, you should fuel up. Whether you've got half a tank or an empty tank, you should always fuel up every time you see somewhere because they're not readily available every five k's okay so a roadhouse is a gas station. station and a restaurant or what is a roadhouse yes roadhouse has basically everything i believe they even have an emu farm there so you can actually see some <laughs> emus right beside it but yes you go in there you can have a meal you can get some fuel i do believe they have a camping ground out the back as well people okay. actually stop off on theirs but it's like a the t interjunction so you've got the road that goes from darwin all the way down to adelaide and this is actually just the t junction that goes into uluru or ezra Okay. And the roadhouse is right on the corner. It's very easy to stop off there, but yeah. And you will stop off there on the way back as well. But anyway, you go into a couple of more 100 kilometres in and you'll actually turn right into the road that goes up to Kings Canyon and you'll stop in there. There's a couple of places that you can stay there and more people will actually utilise the camping options because a lot of people are actually doing their big lap around Australia and they'll camp there. But for me, I always like staying in the resort. It's not one of the cheapest places, but being in Outback Australia, you have a lot less facilities. They need a lot more effort to actually get supplies and everything in. So you can actually find a room for about 200 to 300 US a night. Okay. That's the accommodation. Now, I do suggest staying there for two nights, and then in the middle, you'll actually be doing Kings Canyon. But you can choose. There are dorm-style areas to help get it cheaper for you, but they have shared bathroom facilities and stuff like that. So with the Kings Canyon, I have to say, Kings Canyon is one of my favourite areas in Australia. This would have to be the epitome of my hike. I did this hike for the first time on my own, and I have gone back another two times to actually do it again i can't get enough of this hike there's so much variety so much scenery so much unbelievable scenes especially late in the afternoon when you're not supposed to actually walk it because late in the afternoon is obviously hotter but but yeah they do recommend you actually start at first thing in the morning which is what i'm saying now wake up in the morning go to the hike now king's canyon it basically has one side you climb up one side you go into a gully you climb back up the gully and then back down the other end and then join it's a loop track you won't be returning on the same walk or anything but yeah it's a basically about i think it's about five or six k 
Ks to get around or three to four hours. You can go okay. slow at, or as fast as you want. The toughest bit is the first 20 minutes or half an hour to actually get up the canyon in the first place. Full of stairs and, it yeah, it's just basically climbing stairs for 20 minutes to 30 minutes. It is very much of a heart starter, but don't let that deter you from doing the rest of the hike because the rest of the hike is quite up, down, flat and everything like that. And then when you go into the gully, it's not as long. Into the gully is where they call the Garden of Eden, where they have a sacred Aboriginal site there with yeah, basically a water pool. And it can actually waterfall in the, the summertime, but it's not a time when anybody's actually there so so yeah apart from that it's actually quite calm in the garden of eden but the hike it has all these phenomenal domes and shapes and everything and it's not exactly a form track you will be walking on bare rock you will need probably ankle boots or at least closed in shoes to actually do the hike not only that it's okay. obviously three to four hours but yeah has to be one of my favorite hikes in australia to actually do this one and, and um, we're in central yeah. Australia, so it's all red rock and then very green in the gully that you're talking about. Pretty much, yes, because, yeah, yeah the, the second hike is actually going through the gully. But, yes, on the, the first hike, it's the second side that's probably my favourite, and that's when you're viewing the wall that you've just climbed over. It's just such a smooth wall, and if you catch the sun rays in the afternoon, it is just brightly colored and it's you don't believe it. it's like a postcard and you don't believe you're actually looking at it it's just yeah absolutely amazing yeah but halfway through the walk when you're going down into the garden of eden you do have some wooden boardwalk and stairs to actually get in there which gets a little easier but i do find they're quite skinny so sometimes you have to have to go down on sideways <laughs> to go down okay. there <laughs> yeah, to try and fit them all in, I think. They just needed to go a little smaller stairs, so they're quite skinny, I think, the last time that I went in there. But, yeah, definitely do the little off-cuts. Like it says, it says 800 metres to go to the Garden of Eden. Definitely do that. Don't do the entire walk without doing all the little off-cuts. But my biggest fear is actually getting people getting close to the edge. There is no walls, there's no gates, there's no nothing stopping you. And there have been people that have been injured or falling over the edge for getting too close. The one thing I will say is that keep your distance, keep a couple of hundred metres away. You don't know if wind is actually going to come along and push you further. Yeah, you can still get a phenomenal view from being back from the edge anyway. And there are some higher points that you can see into the gully as well. I know I was probably about a metre away, but I took my camera and put it on a selfie stick over the edge and stuff like that. But yeah, try not to get myself close. So okay yes but anyway the hike is there and you get back to your car park so straight after that there is a smaller hike only takes about probably an hour even less than that and you basically go through the middle section of where you've just climbed over and on the top and it's called king's creek walk and it goes through the middle all the greenery all the gorge in between and stuff like that but you won't actually get to this garden of eden yeah too much bushland and everything to get to there so you do have to do the, the bigger hike to get to the garden of eden so but yeah the king's okay. creek hike is a nice addition especially if you can't do the longer hike because it's not accessible to absolutely everybody okay so what is it we're up to day seven so we wake up the next morning basically just driving to ulara now i don't want to confuse things so we have uluru <laughs> which is the rock <laughs> airs rock is still the rock but Ulara is actually the town that services the people that visit Uluru. Okay. Now, Uluru is actually in a national park. So there's nobody that can actually stay in the national park. Every day you'll be driving in and out of the national park. But where you're staying, where you're camping, where you get food and everything like that is the town of Ulara. All right. Okay, it's got probably about six hotels in there. They've got camping facilities. They have a tourist information center, your restaurant, your cafes. They've even got groceries and you can actually get fuel there. So it's basically a, a little circle. They even have a convenient shuttle bus that actually circles around Ulara to actually get you from place to place if you don't have a car. But 
this is why you hire a car in Alice Springs because I think it's quite convenient. Now, Ulara is at least 30 minutes away from Uluru. There are bus transfers and tours and everything like that that you can pay to get into Uluru, but I find it's a lot easier to hire your own car and drive in and out every day, or a lot cheaper at least. Okay, so day eight. Now this is where we're going into Uluru for the first time. They actually sell national park passes for three days and 12 months. So this is why I recommend actually staying the three days and utilizing that pass for Uluru. You can purchase it either online or you can do it when you're actually driving in for the first day. Okay depending how early that you actually want to go in there. They do open enough for sunrise and sunset because that's one of the biggest things that people do when they're going to Uluru is actually driving. They've got specific sunset and sunrise platforms there. So the first day, it's basically, there's a 10 kilometer walk around the base of Uluru. I think it's 9.5 kilometers, which I think is 5.8 miles. Sounds about right. Yes, so we've got, and that'll take about three to four hours. So it's obviously a loop all the way around the outside, goes from the car park. And there's little off cuts to sacred sites. A lot of areas you may not be able to take photos of because they're sacred sites, but you can get everywhere. You can get right up close. You can touch the rock and everything like that. But yeah, the beauty of Uluru is that it is a single rock. And this is why it's so famous but it's a, a rock monolith. It is just one rock. It measures about 2.2 miles long, 1.5 miles wide, and a circumference of 5.8 miles. Okay. Now, it stands at 348 metres high, which is actually higher than the Eiffel Tower. Okay. <laughs> and it's supposed to actually be bigger underneath. I'm not sure how hmm. much longer it actually, but it is supposed to be, yeah, I think it actually is around two and a half kilometres underneath the ground. Huh. But it's, it's one rock. It's not a mountain made up of a lot of little rocks. But this is where we're walking around. There's different shapes. I know over the years through looking at it, I guess with the rain and the weather and the wind and everything like that, there's different shapes. Like there's this cut out, something that looks like the elephant's tail is on the okay. side of the rock. You've got a simulation of a brain. It actually <laughs> looks like someone's brain and stuff like that. Yeah, there's a lot of imagination that comes into play here, and I guess uh, probably a lot of it came up in their Dreamtime stories, the Aboriginal Dreamtime stories as well. Yeah, it's actually quite fascinating to actually see it, and this is where your imagination comes out, and you can dream up whatever you want there. And you've been there a number of times over uh, more than a couple of years. Yes. And the rules have changed for Uluru in your lifetime. So yes. now we're walking around the rock, and that's what we should expect, right? Correct, yes. But the walk yeah. around the rock was actually always there. It was the climb mm -hmm. up it that actually right. closed. I think it was October 2016 where the climb was actually stopped. I think one of my visits there, I think in 2007, they were actually still running a campaign saying with T-shirts and everything like that saying, I chose not to climb the rock. You were huh. supposed to respect the Aboriginal people and not actually climb the rock. I think when they announced when it was going to close, it was about six months earlier. And yeah, basically what's been left of all the people climbing up there, because obviously there's no facilities up there or anything like that. You will spend a few hours actually climbing up the rock. I've never done it myself. It was always a little bit too high and too windy. There was a chain that people needed to actually climb up there and that chain has now been removed. I know my father actually did it back in, I think it was the late 80s. So we were actually traveling around. It might have been about 80, no, it was actually 79. I think it was about 79 he actually climbed it. And there was no chain at the starting point. I think there was higher up. So, yeah, but there's actually, because of all the people climbing up it, there's left a scar. So you can actually hmm. still see this scar of people and the walking trail actually going up the rock. But, yes, this... 2016 it was actually closed down which isn't a, a, a huge deal I don't think they've got lots of stuff to actually do out at Uluru that you mm -hmm. don't necessarily have to climb it the walk around you do still get close to it you can still touch it yeah so it's just as fascinating to do that and if you can't actually do the walk around there you can go on a segway 
they've got segways there now. <laughs> All right. So, <laughs> hey, and then you mentioned dream time a couple times here. And, and for those of us who are largely ignorant of Aboriginal culture, what is dream time? Well, dream time is where the land and the people were created by the Aboriginal spirits. They made the rivers, they made the streams, they made all okay. the water holes and everything that you see in front of you. This was all made up from the dream time of past generations. Okay. Got it. Got it. Yes. Okay, so basically that first way, like I said, if you can't do the walk, you can do a Segway tour. And the good thing about a, a Segway tour is that you actually get a guide. And the guide might may or may not be Aboriginal, and you can actually get history and stories and everything. I, To be honest, I like actually not always doing stuff on my own. I like getting the guide. You get the history. Sure. You get here, the information. Here. So, yeah. So, yeah, the Sedgeway Tour, I think it still takes at least a couple of hours to get around because as much as you're not having to walk it, you're still stopping a lot and they're telling you about this area and that area and then you're going a little bit further. Yeah. I haven't actually done that Sedgeway Tour, but it's on my list for next time. Okay. The... And you've got us doing two days here, so we're not just going and walking around it twice. No, we've got three days here. We've got three days here, sorry. Yeah, so we're taking advantage of the entire National Park Pass and using three mm -hmm. days actually in the park because there is so much to do. To be honest, you could probably do more, but I think the three days is the, a nice highlight to actually see everything that you possibly can. Okay. Now, on our day nine, we're going back into the park again. You can choose amongst a number of things. This is, for one, going to do a sunrise, a sunset, now, they do have particular areas for sunrise and sunset. I don't necessarily like using their specific. So where they say there's a sunrise set, I like going to the sunset one for sunrise because you actually get a different, as a photographer, I like the different angles. You can mix it up. If, you, if everyone's going to the sunrise platform to actually watch the sunrise, then you'll probably find the sunset one is actually less crowded and different photos you can also do what's called the field of lights and I would say alternate this between whether you're actually doing a sunrise or sunset because the field of lights is something that happens at sunrise and sunset as well so if you're actually doing a sunrise at Uluru you can do the field of lights for sunset now, I did feel like the sunset was actually really good for the field of lights because you basically get taken to this hill on the tour that I actually did. You can only see it from a tour, so you will have to purchase this as an extra cost. You get to this area, you're having some drinks and everything like that. You can see Uluru in the distance in the light, but as the light starts to go down, this is where the field of lights come out. Now, there is at least, I think, 50,000 solar-powered stem bulbs, okay. all different colours, and mm -hmm. actually light up. Basically, you're standing here... The, you're standing in a position, the, field, the bulbs are in front of you, Uluru is behind it. So you're getting this nice view of Uluru with these lights actually shining up in front. And if you're there for sunset, then you're obviously there for daylight and then the sun goes down. And then once the sun is actually set and it's dark, you get to go down and walk in amongst the bulbs. And this was an art installation actually introduced by Bruce Munro. He's actually done a few light installations. I believe he's done a new one in Kings Canyon at the moment. There's another one in Darwin as well. It opened in 2017. And yeah, it's one of the fantastic things about there. It's just something that you're not going to see in Uluru is all these bulbs actually coming out and walking around it. It makes me feel like I'm in the Avatar movie. I don't know if you remember the Avatar movie <laughs> in the Tree of Souls mm -hmm. with all those little lights and everything coming up So uh, in the first Avatar movie. So, yeah, it, it makes me feel, except you've got a lot more colour in the field of lights. Got it. Okay. And between... I have seen a light presentation by Bruce Monroe, which I had to look up, but there is one here in California in Paso Robles called Sensario which is also his. That's why I was just curious. It looked very similar to what I had seen, except that yeah. here there's no big rock in the background and it's in a <laughs> valley. Interesting. Oh, right, yes, yeah. Now, after seeing that, I'll definitely go and see other stuff of his. 
It was absolutely phenomenal. So pick and choose between a lot of different things. They do have camel rides out there. The tour we ended up picking actually went to the Field of Light, so you can join a couple of these things. There is a Sounds of Silence dinner, much the same as the Field of Lights. You can actually be taken to a very luxury spread and get a nice Australian dinner, probably some steak. I think it's a three-course dinner and some drinks and everything, and you've got all these tables actually set up in the white linen. And you're sitting down and basically getting a sunset and dinner in front of Uluru. Now, if anything, I'm going to recommend a helicopter flight. Sometimes they aren't in everyone's budget. But in order to actually see the vastness of Central Australia, how much of nothing it actually is, (laughs) you can't do that (laughs) unless you actually go in a helicopter flight. And I think... In the scheme of things, I think ours was only like 15, 20 minutes and we went over Uluru and what they call, what we call the Olgas or Katatunduja, I think it is. It's actually in the Uluru National Park as well. Mm -hmm. And just as good as Uluru, but it's not one big rock, it's lots of little different rocks. But when you're in the helicopter flight there, they'll fly you over both of them and yeah, it's incredible to actually see that and you just got flat everywhere and then you've just got these things poking out of the ground (laughs) and i'm seeing a number of the flights seem to be at dawn or dusk oh i went in the middle of the day so you can they do go at any time of day so i would prefer when i take helicopters anywhere in the world i will always go in the middle of the day because I don't like hmm. the reflection of the sun coming. So anywhere probably between 10 and 2, I will always take a helicopter flight. Interesting. Yes. A uh, lot of different things. Don't wear white. White reflects in the windows as well. Unless you can actually get a helicopter uh. flight that doesn't have the windows on. And I will always opt for that. But they don't do it a lot in Australia because of security reasons. But yeah, so then there's obviously the Aboriginal cultural experiences that you can do. So there's a tourist information centre actually in the National Park and you can go there and book any of the local tours and stuff like that. I think they have one that you can even make a didgeridoo. Now, if you've ever tried to play a didgeridoo, it's not that easy. (laughs) I know I tried to do one quite a few years ago and yeah, but I think the experience that they have, you can actually paint your own didgeridoo or or make one. You're actually putting your own shapes and they help you design it and everything like that. And they have been taught how to play one or do the sounds of one for a didgeridoo, but yeah, I've got no hope. I don't know. (laughs) It's not easy. (laughs) anyway so day 10 is all about so we've done everything on uluru and stuff now it's trying to do katajuta i think it's pronounced and called the olgas it's actually takes you about 40 45 minutes to actually get from the town of ulara where you're staying into the Mm -hmm. national park past Uluru and we actually have to go to the Olgas. Now they have a platform there as well for sunset and and sunrise as well. If you actually have a lot more time you can actually do that but mainly I like to do the hiking areas in there. Now first up is called the Walpo Gorge Walk which is an easy one hour return walk. It's about uh, 2.6 kilometers and it actually goes through the middle of two of the rocks another kind of gorge sort of thing and you're looking at the towering rock all around you and it doesn't take too long it's a very flat walk so very easy now the second walk is at the other end of the olgas and it's called the valley of the winds i've only actually done about half of this because i ran out of time on the day but it will take about three hours to actually return walk on this and it goes in and out of all these little boulders and areas and stuff like that so if you are into hiking the valley of the winds walk is actually supposed to be quite good okay now being your last night this is you're starting to relax and chill down from being the last of your uluru area this is sometimes nice to where i mentioned yesterday for the sounds of silence dinner Either that or you're actually just hanging out in your hotel. Obviously, it's quite warm. You can go swimming in your hotel and stuff like that. But the Sounds of the Silence dinner, it's not one of the best experiences that I have heard of. I still haven't done it yet, but I have heard, like, the flies can be pretty bad in Central Australia. 
when you're trying to eat outside and this includes if you're <laughs> carrying a sandwich around or anything like that then it can be quite atrocious i think they can be worse in sometimes than others so yeah because it's such a hot dry area there's always flies and i think even wearing blue i've heard wearing blue is bad as well and i remember i had my partner he was wearing a blue shirt and we're at the olgas and i had at least 40 flies taking a photo on his back (laughs) okay so so if you don't like flies (laughs) Yeah, Sounds of Silence Dinner may not be the best place for you to go, but also a wide brim hat and one of those fly nets is probably better. There is no okay. point putting spray or anything, like even spraying around, it, it won't do anything. Putting stuff on your skin, they will still be there. You do need the wide brim hat and a fly net actually coming over the top, and that'll stop you from eating them. <laughs> All right. (laughs) But anyway, that's how I suggest uh, spending your last night actually in Uluru. But yes, the Sounds of Silence dinner, it is a three-course dinner and it can get quite expensive. I think it's anything from about $150 Australian, I think it is, just to have dinner. You can always go to the grocery store, pick up a couple of drinks, get some cheese and biscuits and actually go for a sunset yourself. doesn't hurt and it's a lot cheaper. Yeah, I'm seeing $258 Australian per adult. Okay, a little bit more expensive than what I thought it was. (laughs) That's a a bit high, $164 US as of the time of this recording. It is about the experience where you are. This is Central Australia. Supplies are hard to get there. So it's probably another reason why I say a road trip, because a road trip is always going to be cheaper than a full-on tour. And there's no reasons why you can't do smaller tours along the way to get Mm -hmm. the experience and the knowledge and everything from there. On our last day, this is where we're actually just driving back from Ulara to Alice Springs. It's probably about four and a half hours to actually get there. We're stopping off at the Earl Dunder Roadhouse again. Like I said, the speed limits are, are anything from about 60 miles an hour. But the biggest thing that I will tell you, these long straight roads, there is no fences out there. So cows will run free, camels are there and everything. And I have actually seen car accidents and people running into things because they'll just wander on the road. And if you're not paying attention, the car will be totaled. There's no way you're actually (laughs) getting past a cow. They're big, they're heavy, they will total your car. Pay attention and always make sure that you watch the roads. And I'm assuming that a rental car wouldn't have a rhubarb, for instance, or something that would protect the front of the car. <laughs> Absolutely. But a rhubarb won't even protect you from a cow. Not from a cow, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. I hardly think sometimes when it comes to roos, I've seen them going through the windscreens more than actually the motor. And that's <laughs> a rhubarb's not going to protect you from that either. <laughs> Huh. But, but yeah, your last day in Alice Springs, once you get back into Alice Springs, because it's only four and a half hours, you can take a chill back into Alice Springs. There is a truck museum there if you are into museums. My dad actually helped rebuild a truck that is sitting in that museum. So, yeah, so it's quite interesting. I walked around there once, but, yeah. And there's also the entrance sign. You'll actually be going past the Alice Springs entrance sign. It's always a stop-off point to actually get a photo and your Instagram profile saying, I've been here. (laughs) Okay. And then day 12, you're using it to actually fly out. I would always recommend to, it is good going through Sydney or places like Sydney or maybe Adelaide because I know they have daily flights to actually get there. But if you're in any of the other capital cities around Australia, then you probably will need to connect depending on the day. I am feeling a little foolish because when we talked beforehand, it was like, but is there enough to do? (laughs) (laughs) Have I given you enough to do? (laughs) Yes, that is enough to do. (laughs) You should see the amount of photos that I've got from this region because it's central Australia. Because when you think of Australia, it's roughly the same size or land space as North America. But Continental US, we have yeah. 90, yeah, we have 90, 95% of the population living on the coast. Right. 
There's nothing and, in the middle. And only a tenth the population to start with. <laughs> and the tenth of the population to start with, yes, absolutely. But yes, it's it takes us five hours to fly from one side of the country to another. Yeah, going into central Australia, there is literally nothing else around. And that's why I love the helicopter experience, because it's not until you get up there mm-hmm. that you actually realise you're in the middle of nowhere. But, but yeah, like I said, the things to consider, there is heaps of flies. If you're not a fan of flies, it's probably not the best place to go to, but (laughs) there are ways around it. (laughs) But I just, you don't want to have high expectations or low expectations when it comes to things. The flies are annoying. You are going to eat one or two. (laughs) Okay. Depending on the weather you are, yeah, they are going to be around a lot. Yeah, and you, you can't eat outdoors quite often if you're taking a a day pack or a pack lunch or something with you with a sandwich you will have to go into your car to eat it there they don't like the air con so when you're cranking up the air con in the car you'll find that they'll phase off (laughs) okay good to know and go and hide They'll, they'll go and hide but yes as i mentioned before prices are going to be higher it is a very remote location right for supplies to get people to actually work there this is reflected in the prices of the accommodations i know even to stay in the cheapest place it had basic bed i think a small bar fridge and a bathroom and i think it cost me about 300 australian a night to actually stay Hmm. there yeah and it just goes up in price there anything from five six hundred dollars expect to get dirty there is red dirt everywhere so every day you Mm -hmm. will need a shower after you come home don't take white clothes one don't wear white (laughs) clothes in a helicopter because it reflects in the helicopter but also just don't take them okay (laughs) don't take white clothes they will get extremely dirty people think when you're going to a hot climate that you need to take white clothes or something cool something that breathes and everything like that but no definitely not if you do take white clothes fine expect them to be brown when you come home not white so they are they will (laughs) yeah basically the wind will just shove all this red dirt and push it all on you it's not as if you're going to be rolling around in it but yes there is red dirt everywhere every day you get home and you'll take your shoes and socks off there will be red dirt in your shoes you will have to shake them out every day because it's just it's thick it's sandy and it's dusty got it anything else we should know before we get to some of our wrap-up questions um no i think that's my entire itinerary but yeah the only thing that's close by you obviously could extend that and go either way to darwin or adelaide i know darwin right. for me especially at winter time would actually be quite good with with all the waterfalls and places to swim and, and stuff like that if you wanted to extend it i actually still need to do the road trip up there and and see a place called the devil's marble so i haven't actually been there yet Excellent. You were standing in the prettiest spot in Central Australia. I feel like this is a stupid question, but where are you standing and what are you looking at? I was trying to think. It would have to be, one, standing at the sunset spot at Uluru. Okay. Basically, when the sun sets, this is where your Uluru colours actually come out. I don't know if you know about the shades of colours that the Uluru can change into. But it can not as much as you red. do, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> There's apparently about twelve different shades of colours of Uluru. So depending okay. on the weather, depending on the rain and everything, in the rain it's it's got streams flying down it and it looks quite grey. Depending on the sunset and sunrise, mm. you could get yellow, orange, red. Like it is a bed, big red rock, but it's hard when the sunset comes out trying to take a photo of it. It's got so much vibrance in it, it's just absolutely stunning to look at so Mm. yes if i'm actually anywhere in central australia and actually looking at something it would be probably at the sunset spot in uluru excellent one thing that makes you laugh and say only in central australia i don't know the skippies (laughs) actually you probably wouldn't even know what a skippy is (laughs) i don't know Okay, there's, it's the kangaroos. Sometimes they can be quite unique with their behaviours and stuff like that, and I find them quite cute and funny to actually look at. Now, I call them skippies. Most people, oh, obviously, skippy. you call them Okay, like Skippy, skippy the Kangaroo, the skippy old TV the show. Bush 
kangaroo. Yes, okay. so there's not a lot of people. I am that old actually enough to know. remember Skippy the Bush kangaroo. <laughs> I could even do the song. <laughs> when I was trying to explain it to an American friend of mine the other day and, and said, because they were obviously a lot younger, they didn't know who Skippy was. And I'm like, think of Lassie, but a kangaroo. Yeah, that didn't help either because they're too young for Lassie, I'll bet. <laughs> probably too young. But they did actually know Lassie. Yeah, so because yeah, probably a lot more people being American TV shows, you know a lot more about Lassie. That's funny. Yes, yeah. no, I do remember Skippy the Bush Kangaroo. Yes. Uh, excellent. And if you had to summarize this region in just three words, what three words would you choose? Stunning, unbelievable, mm -hmm. phenomenal. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Our guest again has been Chris Fry from the Aquarius Traveler, 2Ls.com. And Chris, if we want to send people to your best post on Central Australia on your website, where are we going to send them to? Based on the conversation of today, I actually have everything listed that we've talked about today on a road trip from Alice Springs to Uluru. Excellent. That seems like that would be the place we should send them that. I'll put a link to that in the show notes. Chris, thanks so much for coming on Amateur Traveler and sharing with us your obvious love for Central Australia. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Chris. I really enjoyed it. Thanks again this week to the patrons of the show who help support Amateur Traveler every week with their donations. If you're interested in becoming a patron of the show or just learning more, go to patreon.com slash amateur traveler. When this show comes out, I think most of you will be thinking about the holidays and not thinking about next April, but you might want to think about it if you're interested in joining me in Morocco. There are still some spaces available in the second tour to Morocco. Uh, for more information about that, go to amateurtraveler.com slash trips. And with that, we're going to end this episode of Amateur Traveler. If you have any questions, send an email to host at amateurtraveler.com or better yet, leave a comment on this episode at amateurtraveler.com. And thanks so much for listening. <laughs>